take questions along the way as we go on. The first topic on disconnect and the power of derivatives. Uh, Dan will take a deeper dive into the options and the effects of these options uh, and the derivatives used today to create the disconnect in the markets. Uh, Warren Buffett once called these instruments financial weapons of mass destructions. Derivatives have a major role in the had had actually a major role in the financial crisis of 2008 and the subprime mortgage markets. Um, and it's going to be an interesting it's going to be interesting how they how the options stack up this time. And again, Dan will take a deeper dive into that. The next topic on the Federal Reserve. Um, the Federal Reserve was actually created. Uh, the act was created in 1913. Um, the Reserve Act gave 12 newly created Federal Reserve banks the ability to print money and, and ensure economic um, stability and also to maximize employment um, in an effort to keep inflation low. Um, its authority was granted uh, in 1913 to conduct the nation's monetary policy, provide and maintain the, um, the effective payment system, and to supervise and regulate the banking operations. Um, some of the key players in the Federal story, in the Federal Reserve story, were um, McAdoo. Uh, McAdoo was the first federal chairman of the newly created Fed. Um, Paul Volcker uh, was focused on the war against soaring inflation. Uh, ben Bernanke, my favorite, um, led the uh, federal, response, federal response to the great, uh, great financial crisis. Um, and um, with a focus on a, a 2% inflation process. Now, Fed, now uh, Ben Bernanke actually did um, a thesis in 1920 on 1929 crash and the Great Depression and uh, realized that um, flooding the economy with money was one of the things that would have kept the circulation of money uh, in, in place in 1929. And then... Earning him the nickname Helicopter Ben. Helicopter Ben, yeah, thanks, Dan. <laughs> um, and then we got Jerome Powell uh, that came on in 2018 that is now leading our current crisis as we are in um, of COVID-19. You can see what um, what a shutdown in the markets over in Europe has done because the uh, European markets have now shut down all bars and restaurants um, to fight this effect against COVID-19. Um, is that good? Is that bad? We'll see. Maybe the future will tell us. But um, and then finally, the election. And Dan's going to go more specifically into the markets leading into the election and um, what has happened in past. And Dan, why don't you take us into that deep dive on those three topics? Yeah, thanks, Rick. So um, I think we all know the story here a little bit, but uh, just to quantify it. So there's a huge disconnect right now between the market and the economy. And the best way to quantify that is just by looking at US GDP uh, versus the stock market versus the S&P 500. So first quarter of the year, Q1, we saw a big correction in the stock market. Uh, February, what was it, Rick? February 12th, I think, February 19th, uh, somewhere in that week, we had the peak of the market. Um, COVID-19 shutdown started, and we had the, the trough of the market occur March 23rd. So in Q1 2020, the S&P 500 was down 9%. Um, the drawdown was actually closer to 30 to 35% if you took it from the peak to the trough. Um, and then interestingly enough, in Q2, uh, as you can see here, the market was up 7% uh, as GDP uh, just plummeted. So most of what we look at here is, is year to date. This is where that disconnect comes into play. Year to date, uh, GDP is down, and this is an estimate because the Q3 numbers are not finalized yet, but year to date, the GDP is down about 4%, uh, and the market is up close to, close to 6%. So the disconnect is pretty palpable, um, and what we've seen, as Rick 
mentioned uh, leading into this conversation today, uh, the market is down three and a half percent today alone. Um, so we have a ton of volatility. There's a lot of stuff going on. And what we're going to try to do is uh, peel back the veneer a little bit and and get to really where where all this craziness is coming from, why things are so disconnected. First thing that we're seeing a, a ton of is options activity. So derivatives are calls, puts, essentially contracts on future price movement movements in a stock uh, or in an index. And I'm just going to, there's a lot of, a lot of squiggles here on this page. So I'm going to try to just call out the important pieces here. Um, this green chart right here, the top of that is in March, 2020 options activity on the S and P 500 spiked. And then you see this pink line over the pat really since the bottom over the past six months has also spiked. That's options activity on single stocks. Things like, as you can see on the right hand side, Apple, right? So we have a ton of options activity happening in these big tech stocks. Um, most of that is being fueled by large institutional investors uh, such as SoftBank. Uh, SoftBank has uh, approximately $4 billion a day worth of options that are being traded. And that typically amounts to a, a nominal value of about $30 billion, meaning per dollar that they spend, uh, it actually has an effect of, you know, somewhere between eight to $10. In other words, what's happening a lot now is you see large institutional investors like SoftBank and even retail investors following SoftBank uh, saying, you know what, we don't really want to own the stock anymore. If I have a dollar to buy stock, you know, I'd rather that go to the future price movement. So that dollar can potentially have an impact of 10 times the amount uh, by trading on future price movements. Um, and here's why that's, here's why that's important. Because when you take those big tech stock names, such as Apple, out of the S&P 500, right? So this is Facebook, Amazon, Apple, Microsoft, and Google, uh, the five largest stocks in the S&P 500. They've returned 39% year to date. So talk about a disconnect. Um, you know, we were saying 6% up versus a negative 4% GDP changes the disconnect. Uh, you know, those names are up 39%. So that's a, that's an incredible disconnect. The rest of the S&P, or as it is sometimes referred to the S&P 495 is actually down 1% on the year, the remaining 495 companies. And this, uh, this trend follows pretty closely for market cap or for top performers. So on the right hand side, you see a chart. If you remove the top 10 companies from a return standpoint from the S and P 500, you go to being up 6% to down 4%. And a lot of this has to do with the options activity that's being traded on these stocks, bidding up prices um, by uh, both retail investors and institutional investors, essentially doubling down on their bets. Okay, now where this is important is in, in a couple scenarios, uh, you know, for diversified investors, when we're looking at the index, two things happen. Number one, we're seeing things like the S&P being up when there's no reason that it should be up, uh, you know, because we've had shutdowns, we've had GDP decreasing. Um, but number two, if you are not overweight, some of these larger names, a lot of times it looks like 
you're going to be underperforming. Um, and it's somewhat of a self-fulfilling prophecy because these indexes are market cap weighted. So the larger these stocks get, the larger they are as a component to the index, the more options activity they have trading on them. And all this does is serves to just bid up the price uh, of all these major tech stocks. So uh, I really don't want to use the word bubble because I think it's overused a little bit, but um, we can definitely say that a lot of this price movement is coming from these large tech names. Well, I, uh, well I'm going to just jump in here real quick, Dan. If there are any questions on the call, um, you can jump into your question and answer um, section there. And what I'll do is I'll inform or bring on the question to Dan and um, or bring on the question to the um, to, to the process. And then we'll go through answering those questions one at a time. Yeah, you guys should see a uh, Q&A bubble in your toolbar. If you click on that, you should be able to submit a question. Um, so Rick talked, Rick talked a little bit about the Fed and I'm pretty sure we brought this exact chart up in our last quarterly conversation. Uh, I anticipate bringing this chart up in almost every single quarterly conversation uh, until the Federal Reserve decides to uh, stop manipulating uh, the monetary supply, which based on the current mandate of the Fed uh, does, well, does not seem to be the case. And here's why this is important, because we can track from, and this is really, this is looking back 10 years. So uh, we actually don't see it from the financial crisis. I could have put it in there, but I want to, I kind of want to show really where the effect is here. The blue line is the Federal Reserve's balance sheet. So the Federal Reserve uh, creates cash, creates more money supply in uh, multiple different ways, but where that's reflected is on the balance sheet. So as that blue line heads up, that means the Fed is creating cash. Now, what you will see is there's a pretty good correlation between the Fed creating cash and the market, the red line, which is the S&P 500, uh, increasing. So this is the level of the index. Now, when the Fed starts to taper, which you can see happened in uh, late 2018 is when that started. You can see very slightly they started tapering that the same thing happened to the market. We had a big correction uh, at the end of 2018. I think it was September to uh, Christmas Eve, I remember, because uh, Rick and I were, were working that week uh, trying to take advantage of that, of that uh, downturn. Right um, up into Christmas Eve. Right up into Christmas Eve, right. And that really was, was you know, because the Fed started pulling, pulling dollars out. Now, here's where it's really pretty interesting. So we had the effect of COVID where you see the market, uh, the, the market dropped fairly substantially there. And almost immediately, the Fed started pumping money in. And what happened, as soon as that blue line shot up, so did the market, right? So this, this isn't really a new phenomenon um, that the level of asset prices tends to follow the money supply that the Fed is creating, okay? And here's why that's important, a couple, couple reasons. The first is the level of liquidity the Fed created this time. So um, what we are looking at here is the last two recessions. So technically, the, this, these shaded areas, these gray shaded areas are recessions. So technically, we are in the middle of, from an economic perspective, uh, the way that the economists are defining this, we are in the middle of a recession, okay? Last time there was a recession, which was 2008, uh, technically the start of that, I believe, was 
October 2007. Uh, what you can see is from the start of the recession, it took the Fed just about a year and a half to start creating money. This is this what you're seeing here, this blue line is new dollars being pushed into the economy. Okay, and what you can see is that didn't turn negative until, like I said, late 2018, when the market started going the other way. So technically, they were pushing new dollars in uh, for, you know, about five years and then started tapering back. The interesting thing is in this case, the level of liquidity that the Fed created, you can see up there, okay, was immediate is the first thing that jumps out. This is within 30 days of the shutdowns and more than was created throughout this entire process of trying to recover from the last recession. Okay. And what we are looking at here is a scenario that essentially means a temporary disruption, right? This was not the collapse of the housing market. Um, this was not uh, a collapse in the business cycle or, um, you know, anything other than a temporary disruption uh, in economic activity. Uh, there are shutdowns. Um, not that it's not serious, but uh, it, it really uh, was not necessarily, it didn't have anything to do with the underlying fundamentals of the economy. The issue here that we're seeing is when we need this much liquidity uh, and this dramatic of a response almost immediately, it's, it's concerning because when we hit the point where there are fundamental issues in the economy, when we do get to the contractionary phase of the business cycle, of the economic cycle, um, th where do we go from there? Right. So that's that's really the major issue here. Oop, trying to there we go. Um, one of the reasons this is a problem is, as I'm sure everyone has seen, uh, interest rates are back to record lows again, almost almost immediately. Um, this is a really interesting chart because this goes all the way back to the 50s and again, Recessions are shaded areas in this chart. So you can see all the recessions and you can see how, you know, every time that you're in a recessionary environment, what do you get? You get interest rates going down, interest rates going down every single time. Um, reason for that, not, uh, not too complex, but uh, rates going down, it's going to uh, uh, stimulate economic activity. Cheaper to get money, right? So if we're in a recessionary environment, what does the Fed want to do? They want to make it easier for you to get money to buy a house, to buy a car, to whatever. Um, that's why rates typically go down when you hit a recessionary environment. Now, this is looking at a longer term debt cycle. Uh, and I do want to talk a little bit, and we're going to get there, talk about this, this stage of the 70s and the early 80s, when rates were uh, out of control, high double digits, uh, great for savers, not great for borrowers. Uh, but the issue here is, from where we are today, we have nowhere else to go. Right. And if if you remember the issue coming out of 2009 for an extended period of time was the same thing. Where do rates go if we need to stimulate economic activity? If we hit another recession, what what do we do? So the Fed was able to start increasing rates. Um, and unfortunately, all that it took 
uh, was about three to six months of shutdown for those rates to just crater out again. Um, so the concerning thing here is in the longer term debt cycle, you look at this and you think, well, okay, the only way for the Federal Reserve to create more inflation, to create an environment where they can increase rates is to keep pumping money into the economy. And the catch 22 there, unfortunately, as we, as we just looked at is the continuance of pumping money in will just further inflate the stock market. It'll further that disconnect between the reality and the economy. And what we want to pay attention to is a scenario like coming out of the uh, late 50s into the 70s where interest rates run away over the next decade, right? Because there is, you cannot continue printing money for free. And I want to get a little bit deeper into what that means. So um, this is something to keep an eye on because we are at a point where rates cannot go any lower. All right. So the really big picture, I was, I was showing you back to the 50s. This one goes back to almost the 1850s. Um, is another piece of sort of that cheap money, right, is debt. So the other thing that's happening is not just asset prices currently are getting inflated, um, but there are government stimulus packages, right? So we have um, things such as stimulus checks, right? But there's other places uh, of government revenue that uh, have been sacrificed due to COVID. You know, student loan interest rates for the government were set to 0%. Um, the government does no, no longer requires require, uh, distributions from retirement accounts this year. Uh, that's lost tax revenue. Uh, all this stimulus, uh, PPP loans, all this stimulus ends up hitting our debt, right? Um, this chart shows you the debt to GDP ratio, okay? Now, you know, debt, when we think about the government is a lot different than, you know, a personal balance sheet. So uh, in a lot of cases, it's not necessarily about always a balanced budget from a government level. But the important thing is that we are in a responsible zone of debt to production, debt to GDP. So this is a more of a relative measure of how much debt we're taking on. The interesting thing here is from COVID-19, this is an estimate from the IMF, you see that dotted line there. So it, the debt to GDP ratio is already climbing up and it just shot up from COVID. You can see this other, this other uh, major increase was after the Great Recession. Um, we are at a point that the amount of debt we have, and this is not just the US, by the way, this is, this is all developed economies. This is not just a US problem. Um, but the amount of debt to GDP is at the same level that it was during World War II. So again, I said this before, but I'll reiterate it. Uh, COVID-19 is a big problem. I don't know if I would compare it to World War II I don't know if I would compare it to a once in a generation recession collapse of the housing market. And the problem is, is most of these indicators are showing us that from an economic standpoint, that is how it's stacking up to those other events. And the concern is, is that with that artificial uh, in, inflation of asset prices due to um, the Fed creating new money, that the, that disconnect is not just a phenomenon, but that it is, it, it's, it's real. It's that the market truly is disconnected from reality. And that at a certain point, likely when the Fed stops or 
at least subsides uh, their new money creation, the market is likely to come back to earth. We don't know when or by how much, but the idea would be that first chart that I showed with that correlation will likely hold true. I'm trying to change here, there we go. So long-term cycle, we talked about this and, and Rick and I have been talking about this for a little while now, um, but we see, we see today's market as having a lot of eerie similarities to where the market was heading into the 1970s. I showed you on the long-term debt cycle, the long-term interest rate cycle, how uh, a lot of those uh, heading into the decade of the 70s, um, you know, rates were at a fairly low point. I actually didn't put it on this on this slide, um, but they were reduced heading into both of these decades, right? We just had a, a, a reduction in interest rates. Um, in the 1970s, what we had was the gold standard, which was abolished. So President Nixon abolished Bretton Woods. Uh, and at the time from Rick's, uh, Rick's Federal Reserve Chairman uh, key players, uh, Paul Volcker presided over the Federal Reserve uh, at that time. And after the gold standard was abolished and there was an oil embargo, so you had high volatility in commodity prices and you had currencies uh, around the globe essentially uh, trying to figure out uh, what their value was, we had a low inflation environment heading into that, which essentially just started to run away. And Paul Volcker was often criticized for his handling of that because his entire philosophy was, and this was pre, pre Bernanke, uh, but his entire philosophy was you have to let that happen. You have to let that inflation run. You have to let interest rates go up because it's essentially the, for lack of a better term, the comeuppance for uh, bad monetary policy, okay? Ben Bernanke comes into play in the 2000s and says, you know, the, all of this, all of this uh, old stuff doesn't apply anymore. You know, we're now, we're no longer on the gold standard. The dollar is the reserve currency of the world. Everyone's pegged to the dollar. Um, and we have more monetary tools and we can just create money. And that was his entire uh, uh, mandate was to just target inflation by creating money through monetary policy. Okay. So what we see heading into 20, the 2020s is a lot of uh, currencies are starting to look into floating free. This has happened in uh, 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 European countries and China has been uh, known to manipulate currency. What happens is when the dollar, when the Federal Reserve starts to create cash in the US economy, that's not free. We're drawing on our credit from the rest of the world. So if we continuously do that for our own benefit, the status of the dollar as the reserve currency of the world could be an issue. So if we start to see a fall in the dollar and the strength of the dollar, that could be a concerning thing because the other piece that's happening very similar to the 70s, not the same as the oil embargo, but we're seeing a collapse in the oil market. This was back in, when was it, Rick? April? Uh, we had oil at like negative $30 a barrel. Yeah, it was late, late March, early April, negative $37 a barrel. Yeah. First so, time ever. First time ever. You, you know, basically they, they couldn't get rid of it fast enough. And uh, at the end of the day, these are, these are different events, but they have the potential to be the catalyst that creates an environment like the 1970s um, where you cannot just continue to push money into the levels of 
uh, a once in a generation recession, uh, 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 the largest war of the last two centuries, um, you know, and have this level of debt without inflation coming back. Yeah, yeah actually, Dan, in, um, in, in the book, um, Currency Wars by, uh, I think his name is John Rickard, um, he, he talked about that. Actually, the first currency war in 2020 and 21 to 36, but the next currency war started in 1967, which you're talking about why we came off the gold standard. And um, basically, the, the, the sterling had a couple of different collapses from 1967 all the way into 1970, um, which, it, which pushed them to lower their, their currencies. And, um, and as they lower in currencies, they, um, they can create, they can create uh, growth within their market. And um, it ended up, that's why we had to pull off the gold standard in the, in the, in the early 70s, because um, we were not able to control our currencies at that level being on the gold standard. So that was the, that was the, that was the other part of the, of the currency war was that number two. The number three was the currency war in 2010, um, where um, basically to get growth back out of the market, we had to deflate, we had to deflate um, um, our um, currency a bit to be able to get trade back in order. But that's the, the interesting part about this whole thing is he goes on to talk about um, the four basic components of growth in the GDP, one being consumption, one being investment, uh, which, is, which is investment in business and plant equipment and housing, the other being government spending, and then the last being net, net exports. Um, and I think he was, he, you know, he was talking about once, once, we, once consumption stops happening, um, then, then investments stop, ha stop happening. When those two pieces go, the government starts to pick up their spending. And what you're talking about now, the, 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 the amount of spending and the amount of um, 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 involvement of the Fed in the market, when that starts to be, uh, when they start to get some pushback on that, the only other alternative is the, is the devaluing currency. But our goal is to keep the currency strong in our market. But uh, when it comes down to um, trying to create growth in our market, which we lost in, in, uh, in the 70s for, for quite a while, um, it comes down to how do we create um, exports to create growth in our economy. And, um, you know, I think you're going to talk a little bit more about what happened in the 70s coming up here. Um, yes. With the chart there. Yeah, there you go. And uh, what happened as, the, as that drop came into play and how long it took to get that market to come back. Yeah, so I, and I, th actually this is great because I have a question here that I'm gonna, I'm gonna read this out loud. I don't think everyone can see the questions, but somebody typed one in. So I'm gonna read this out loud and, uh, and I'll an answer this in the, in the context of this chart. So the question is, uh, if we're moving towards a possible recession, would you suggest keeping cash liquid or continue investing into the market if you are working on a 15 year plan. Um, so my answer to that would be that if you just take it from the perspective of this, this uh, chart of the market in the 1970s, right? So um, we're talking about comparing to the uh, the stagflationary environment of the 1970s, essentially, that means there's high inflation, low economic growth. So not uh, not exactly what you want to be caught in the middle of. Um, and you can see from this chart, that type of an environment is high volatility, right? This is moving around a lot. Um, big crash, correction, but by and large, it's it's you know this type of a market is is just pretty flat right this is an entire decade where if you were invested on january 1 heading into the decade and then you're sitting there on december 31st 10 years later um technically there's not a whole lot of growth there now you could stretch this out and obviously the longer you stretch this out the better it looks um but to answer the question you know, there are a ton of opportunities within this volatility. And we always talk about it's very hard to time the market. Okay. But 
when you have a movement like this, that's not that hard to figure out, okay, we should be putting cash to work. And this is why uh, back in March, we were more optimistic about putting cash to work, even though at the time, uh, you know, uh, the, the economy was shut down because we were down 30 to 35%. Uh, and the Fed started to create liquidity, which we know is good for the market. Um, but with where we stand today, we're being a little more cautious. So, uh, you know, from a long-term perspective, we're still optimistic. We think that we can navigate through this. Um, we want to keep an eye on when the Fed stops creating the liquidity because that's going to be an investment opportunity for additional cash to be put in in chunks. Um, but today we're we're just we're being very cautious with new cash. But by and large, when we're talking about a, a 15 year plan, we're sticking to the plan. We're dollar cost averaging in because that's going to help you take advantage of the volatility. Now, look, if you say I need the money in the next two to three years, then maybe a different story. Right. right. Because, you know, I can tell you that over a 15 year time span, for the most part, we're, you know, we're going to be optimistic. We're going to be fully invested. But over the next two to three, you know, it's going to be uh, it's going to be iffy. Yeah, you made money. This the, this crash in 1973 actually dropped down. I think what well, you said, 35 percent down. It actually never came back until 19, roughly around 1984. Um, and I think it shows 1980, I think, in this chart here. Um, yeah. Yeah. But ultimately, it didn't come back until 1984. And if you just let your money drop and let it sit, it took you 10 years to get your money back. If you continued to plunk money in on a regular basis um, throughout that volatility, uh, your returns were, and I think I did this a, a while back, was roughly about 6% on average for that new money going in over a period of time. Right. Right. Yeah. That's, and that's the, uh, that's the double edged sword of volatility. All right. Oh, right. Let's talk about the election. So it's, <laughs> <laughs> um, so this has been, this has been coming up a lot. Uh, people asking about the election, what it means for their portfolio. Um, and first off, this is, this has nothing to do with anything other than just the presidential election. So we are within this time frame. This is the S and P 500 return eight calendar days before the presidential election since 1944. Uh, so on average, the market is up two and a half percent. Interestingly enough, it has been up on those eight calendar days prior to the election every time except for two. Um, today doesn't give me a lot of faith that we're going to be up uh, going into this presidential election just because we were we were down you know three and a half percent just today. But um, you know earlier in the week we did have. Uh, I think Monday we were we were up. So, but in any event, this is typically going into the election. Markets are up. Okay. Uh, we said this earlier, but this is where it's it's tough to say. This may be a close election. Okay. Um, coming out of an election. This is looking at uh, November 1, 2000 through the end of the year. So the final, final two months of 2000. And if you remember, 2000 uh, was the contested results of the Bush-Gore election. So I thought this was interesting to just kind of highlight is typically going into the election, no matter how, con you know, how contentious it looks, for the most part, typically markets are up. Coming out of the election is another story. Uh, and this is a case where, again, just close call, uh, contested election, markets, markets were down going into the end of the year uh, in that case, okay? Um, again, obviously, a lot of this is anecdotal. And a lot of times I 
I don't really like comparing uh, what does the market do versus, you know, presidential elections versus the party that is in the White House. You know, I've seen charts that are, uh, you know, well, what happens when the incumbent wins? What happens when a new party takes over? What happens when it's Democrat? What happens when it's Republican? What happens when, you know, so there's all these different ways you can spin it. Okay. Uh, here's the thing though. You can rest assured that it's going to have an effect in the short term. Because this is top of mind right now. Um, but we just talked for the last half an hour about high debt levels, about the Federal Reserve's balance sheet, about interest rates, about the economic cycle. And neither of these candidates are saying, you know, we need better monetary policy. We need to balance the budget. Um, we need to think about what pumping all this liquidity into the markets is actually doing to us long term. In fact, they both seem to be uh, complicit in continuing to do this. Um, so our theory is that at the end of the day, it really doesn't matter for, for your portfolio over the long haul. It really doesn't matter who wins next week or let's say in the next two months, who, know, who knows if this will be uh, decided next week. Um, it really doesn't matter from a long-term perspective because guess what? The Federal Reserve is going to keep pumping that money into the economy. Um, it, there seems to be a commitment to continued, uh, you know, government spending on things like stimulus, on um, debt levels rising, um, and those are the things that are really going to have a major impact from an economic perspective. Um, just to just to pull back for a second, uh, just to keep some perspective, we're, um, you know, I feel like we're we're being a little pessimistic to an extent. Um, but this is what we, we want to show you is that uh, at the end of the day, okay, again, there's 1970 again, going back to 1970. Uh, this is the change in the market during bull and bear markets since 1970. This is up, up through the last, uh, the end of the last bull market, which happened just before COVID. So to keep some perspective and going back to the question we had about a 15 year time frame. Take a 15 year time frame from, from any of these, any 15 year time frame. As long as you stay invested and as long as we keep pumping money in, you're going to be up. Because these, these bear markets, even though they're scary, from a bigger picture perspective, they're blips. Markets tend to grow. So in, in just in closing, uh, the things that we're kind of keeping an eye on is, is an addiction, the addiction to cheap money for the U.S. economy and really for the developed global economy in general. Uh, COVID is likely to be a, a catalyst to uh, a potential change in the economy, not necessarily the cause. Uh, most of the <clears throat> most of these changes, these issues were not brought on just by a shutdown. Um, it was brought on by, you know, years of, you know, monetary policy uh, and money printing sort of run amok. And lastly, as, as we just talked about the presidential election, it's likely to have a short term impact on your portfolio, not as much of a long term effect. And that's everything we have today. So I'm going to uh, I'm going to open it up here to questions. If anybody wants to type anything into the chat box, um, but otherwise, it was it was great talking to to everyone. I hope this was valuable. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, and we're also we're this is recorded. We're going to put it on YouTube too. So if uh, you want to share it with anyone, we would we would uh, we would love that. We'd also like to have a lot of input too. So um, if the opportunity comes up, uh, just kick us out an email.
and let us know what we could do better and how we can change things. Mm -hmm. And then you get a question that just popped up. Um, what investment yep. decisions were, were, were wise in the seventies that could be replicated today? Yeah. So going into a inflationary high inflation environment like the seventies. So if we, if we knew for a fact that the seventies were going to repeat themselves, typically the types of asset classes that would perform well in that type of environment would be things like um, uh, real estate, uh, gold, you know, sort of your safer haven type of, of assets or what I, I suppose would be um, uh, seen as your safer haven type of assets. Um, you know, depending on the actual environment, you know, if inflation is a, a concern, you know, on the bond side of the portfolio, uh, inflation adjusted securities. So, you know, treasury inflation adjusted bonds would be, um, would perform better in that type of environment. Um, you know, and as is typically the case on, from a stock and equity perspective, the best, the best companies to be in, in that scenario would be companies who have dividend payouts with high free cash flow because you'll be getting your return from those dividend payments. So as long as you're okay with the price volatility and the company has strong free cash flow, the returns can come through reinvested dividends. So what wouldn't work in that type of environment, just to kind of answer the other side of the question, is what has worked over the past 10 to 20 years, which are the high growth stocks, which are the Amazons and the, and the Googles of the world, the ones where uh, essentially all of your returns are just coming from market cap growth. Yeah, yeah the, the, uh, the other thing you emphasized there, Dan, was real estate. Um, back in the 70s, uh, we, had, we had a couple anomalies going on. Was One was um, you, had the biggest, you had the biggest generation um, that existed coming out of the... Um, coming out of World War II was the baby boom generation. And their incomes were rising fairly aggressively. And they were all moving out into the, the world of work and the buying of houses and real estate continued to go up. And the faster interest rates went up to try to control inflation, the more housing went up to try um, mm -hmm. as, as, they, as, they, um, as they continue to go work their way out into the suburbs. And where we are today with that is money supply is so vast right now and earnings have been flat for a long period of time. And we got the next biggest generation, bigger than the baby boom generation, which is the millennial generation coming into the world of buying houses. So real estate might be an opportunity there too. Yep, you got, you got another up. one here. Go ahead. What's this? Would more stimulus money coming from the government turn out to be beneficial to returns? Uh, assuming that's portfolio returns. Um, so stimulus. Two things, there's fiscal policy and there's monetary policy. Monetary policy is the Fed uh, buying bonds in the open market, is the Fed uh, reducing the, the uh, uh, overnight repo rate, the Fed literally m increasing the money supply. Uh, fiscal policy is when you get a check from the government or when the government says, you know, you don't owe, owe interest on your student loans or that adds to the debt. So stimulus, what tends to happen with stimulus dollars is there's not really a direct correlation to portfolio returns, but there is a direct correlation to the level of debt and the implied future inflation. Because the more money that you put into the hands of the consumer, the more that inflation is going to run away. So it's, it's, it's interesting because uh, in a lot of cases where these stimulus checks are, uh, you know, very much needed uh, for, you know, for, for some of these uh, individuals, long term, it actually ends up hurting most of the people who need the stimulus checks because it creates inflation over long term periods. Now, right now, there's not much inflation, but the concern is more stimulus money with increased money supply means inflation has to come back at some point. 
Um, but most of the things that most, most of what affects portfolio returns is the, the uh, Fed's balance sheet. And at the, with uh, remember the four components of um, of GDP, one of them being um, consumption. And when you yeah. offer stimulus, like you said, Dan, stimulus is short term. So the fastest way that we can get money out on the market and keep or amount money out in the economy and keep money being spent. And remember, Bernanke's thesis was keep that circulation of money going. The stimulus is short term, um, and it and it basically it'll 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 keep the economy going and it'll, it'll keep it going until there's another grip that we can have to be able to continue growth moving forward. So um, it does work as a, as a short-term component on the short-term component, but not like you said, on the long-term process. Yep. So I think we are almost there. Um, do we have any other questions that came up? I don't see anything. Any other final uh, comments? Daniel? Nope. Okay. I think we're good to just stop this recording. So, um, 